straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Emotional text messages from friends of Dylan Redwine as they search for the 13-year-old. I have loved you to this day, and it breaks my heart to know you're gone. His father, now on trial, accused of murdering his son after the boy found compromising photos of Mark Redwine. Plus, Derek Chauvin will learn his fate, an attorney for George Floyd's family, on what they would consider a fair punishment. Brother versus brother. A trial date now set for one of the defendants in the Pike County Massacre. This case kind of took a 180. One way George Wagner plans to defend himself against his younger brother's claims. And the Robert Durr's trial on hold. The break as shocking testimony puts the defendant near the crime scene when Susan Berman was murdered. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A loving father or an enraged man who killed his son. Those are the portraits being painted of Mark Redwine in a Colorado courtroom. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with the first witness to testify about the disappearance of Dylan Redwine. Yeah, Brian, the video that you're about to see looks a lot different than what we would usually show you because it comes from a web system that the court is allowing the public to use to watch the trial. On the first full day of testimony, the jury heard from friends of Dylan Redwine's about the last text messages they ever sent him. Dylan Redwine was 13 years old in 2012 and texted with his friends frequently. Dylan ever talk about running away or hurting himself during his friendship with you? Uh, never, no. On November 18th, Dylan was on a court-ordered visit with his father, Mark Redwine, over the Thanksgiving holiday. Ryan Nava said he was expecting Dylan to come to his grandmother's home early the next morning. When you woke up and you realized Dylan was not there, what did you do? I, uh, I got up and I went outside to look for him. Maybe he was sitting out on the we have a patio area. Um, like I said, he's familiar with that part of my grandmother's home. So I went outside and sit, um, I took a look around. Still in there? No, sir. Prosecutors claim Mark Redwine killed his son sometime on November 18th, 2012, possibly after Dylan confronted his father about photos of him wearing women's clothes and eating feces out of a diaper. But Redwine's lawyers say Mark Redwine is innocent and that Dylan may have been abducted or run off. You told the FBI agent you knew Dylan was not scared to hitchhike. Yeah, yeah, I remember saying that. Amanda Saxton broke down as she read from a text that she sent to Dylan, who called her Kitty. I promise I will find you, and that's a promise I'm willing to keep until the day I die. I love you. The defense questioned Saxton about how Dylan might react to a bad situation. You know from, from watching Dylan, from talking to him, from going through childhood together, um, that if he got angry or upset, it wasn't uncommon for him to just walk away from the situation, correct? Yes. And the defense is suggesting that Dylan may have encountered some type of situation and simply walked away or run away, or maybe that somebody else injured him. Uh, Redwine's attorney said in opening statements that there was damage from animals to Dylan's remains. His skull was actually found a distance from his the rest of his body. Brian? Thanks, Angina. Joining us today is civil rights attorney Jeff Storms and Terry Austin. Jeff, what do you make of the defense that someone may have abducted Dylan or a bear or, or lion got involved? It's a doubt, but does it sound reasonable? Well, Brian, with respect to the animal, the first thing I'll say is this is taking place in Durango, Colorado, which is gorgeous. And I don't think we should fear the animals uh, very much hiking in Durango, Colorado. Death by a cougar or a bear is extremely rare. Uh, far more rare than a murder. And here we have a very clear motive and explanation. And so I think, you know, you're looking at a typical uh, distraction argument, and I don't know that it's going to be enough to raise any sort of reasonable doubt. Now, Dylan was 13 at the time. It's nine years later. So some of these witnesses are in their early 20s. Terry, how are these witnesses so far, especially the uh, young adults who are testifying? Did either side bring up strong points for their argument? Well, I think both of them did a great job that I've seen so far, both Ryan and Amanda Saxon. I mean, they were 13 at the time, 22 now. That's still extremely young, if you think about it. And they did establish the fact that 
even though there might have been some rowdiness as far as Dylan was concerned. He was a fun-loving child. He was a normal child. They had normal banter back and forth. So I definitely think the prosecution is trying to establish that he was a normal child, that he wouldn't just take off and not tell anybody. So I think that was important. Makes sense. And Jeanette, in the openings, uh, the prosecution pointed to the lack of concern Redwine had in searching for Dylan. Did that seem like strong evidence to you? Yeah, and you know, uh, there's going to be more about that. There will be testimony about that. Uh, I spoke with Dylan Redwine's mom, you might recall, last week, and she said that he was not involved in the searches for their son. And I can tell you, that's just not normal behavior for a parent. Of course, everyone reacts to things differently, but I can tell you from my experience as a mom, you know, my child ran away from me. My son ran away from me in a shoe store one time, and I couldn't find him for a couple of minutes, and my heart was just pounding, and I was frantically looking for him. So uh, I think his demeanor will be important in this case. Absolutely. I know they made comments about his light being on and whether or not he came back, but if the underlying issue is that he's eating feces out of a diaper, maybe he doesn't react to most things like the rest of us would. We'll see how the defense makes that argument, though. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the deadly custody battle turning brother against brother. But first, we break down Derek Chauvin's upcoming sentence. We ask George Floyd's family attorney how much they want the former cop to be spending in prison next. Welcome back. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is scheduled to be sentenced this Friday as attorneys are still arguing about how much time he should get for the murder of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin faces up to 40 years in prison. In court documents, prosecutors are asking Judge Peter Cahill to sentence him to 30 years. His defense is requesting time served and probation. A jury convicted Chauvin of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter. At the sentencing hearing, George Floyd's family will have the opportunity to give victim impact statements. Chauvin's defense can present mitigating factors for why they say he should spend less time behind bars. Then, it'll be up to Judge Cahill to decide. Back with us is Jeff Storms, who represents George Floyd's family. Jeff, right off the bat, what does the family want here? Well, you know, Brian, we speak a lot on behalf of our clients, and this is one of the weeks where the clients actually are the ones who get to speak. So... I don't want to say things that the clients are going to have the opportunity to say themselves, but it's fair to say that full justice for this family, full criminal justice, doesn't stop at the conviction. It stops at a sentence that's significant and shows that there is a punishment that fits the crime. You have to remember this is a Black family who for years has watched members of their community be sentenced to very severe, uh, you know, sentences for uh, very minimal crimes. You know, we're talking about generations who have grown up through three strikes laws and things like that. So you can certainly anticipate that you're going to hear from the family that they want there to be a very strong sentence for Derek Chauvin. Now, during our time, we know, I know we met in Minnesota together, we saw many family members speaking uh, about the sentencing here. Who from the family is expected to speak during these victim impact statements? You know, unfortunately, Brian, that's one of the things I really can't address directly right now. But I think what the viewers might find interesting and be a little surprised by is that there are also going to be community impact statements uh, that are, are going to come forward as part of the aggravating factors. We call them Blakely factors in Minnesota. You know, uh, Derek Chauvin's murder of George Floyd resulted in protest and damage to property and impacted the community in such a severe emotional way. And all of that stems from Derek Chauvin's murder. And so what's gonna be unusual is for you know viewers to hear about community impact statements that were provided to the court that the court's gonna consider as part of the sentencing, in addition to those family members who will address the court. Now, Jeff, I've heard yourself as well as attorney Benjamin Crump talk about getting justice both in the civil arena and in the criminal. In this case, George Floyd is getting both. So does Derek Chauvin's sentencing mean closure for the family? You know, not yet, Brian. The job's just not done yet. You know, there's still a federal charge against Derek Chauvin that has to be dealt with. And there are the other three officers who all still have pending state and federal charges. So this family still has a long road to go. 
And so does the prosecution team for Attorney General Keith Ellison and for the feds as well. So we're still, uh, you know, we're still in some ways only the middle of this fight for complete justice for George Floyd. Now, as we both know, there are two roads here. There's a state road and a federal road. Uh, in terms of that federal road, what does the, is the family looking forward to uh, for the federal case? You know, I think, again, I think that the family is looking for the most comprehensive justice possible. And, you know, you'll hear from them this week about what their opinions might be, and they could be diverse in terms of sentencing. But, you know, the federal civil rights case is a case that's based upon race and an intent based upon race. And the family believes very strongly that that's what happened here. And that a federal conviction or guilty plea would be very, uh, would fit. Uh, the crime that Derek Chauvin committed uh, very well. Now, Jeff, uh, as a public defender in Brooklyn, when I read what uh, the defense was asking for in terms of sentencing, time served and probation, I had a reaction to that. I want to know what your reaction to that was when you heard as to what the defense was requesting in terms of sentencing for Derek Chauvin. I think everybody knows that that's a laughable request and it, it's not going to happen, right? None of us ever say that uh, something happens with 100% certainty, but I feel pretty close to saying with 100% certainty that is not going to be the sentence here. You know, here the presumptive set sentence based upon our guidelines in Minnesota is 150 months, but that's before enhancements. Uh, and so I, I have a feeling that you're going to see a sentence that looks much closer to 20 plus years uh, based upon history here in Minnesota and what we saw in the case. Thank you very much, Jeff, and make sure to watch Law & Crime Network. We'll be covering the sentence of Derek Chauvin on Friday. Thank you again. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the trial of Robert Durst and more of the shocking testimony from one of his close friends. Plus, the Pike County Massacre. The trial date set for one of the defendants as his own brother implicates him in the deaths of eight members of one family. More on this deadly custody battle next. The trial date has been set for one of the four people charged in the Pike County Massacre, where eight members of a family were killed in one night. Angela Levy has followed the case since day one and is back with the latest arguments in George Wagner's case. Yeah, George Wagner is Jake Wagner's older brother. His lawyers say that they are still waiting for prosecutors to give them a copy of Jake Wagner's confession to investigators. We will certainly comply with our discovery obligations. Uh, as the court is aware, this case kind of took a 180 about two months ago. George Wagner's attorneys have requested new evidence acquired by prosecutors, including more than 10 hours of recordings with his younger brother, Jake. Prosecutors say Jake confessed to the Roden and Gilly murders and implicated his family. The defense claims they haven't received the recordings. I think we need more than 60 days to investigate uh, whatever we learned in Jake's profit because we've not been provided that, even though it's been available for two months. But in court documents, the prosecution called the defense arguments that evidence hasn't been turned over vexatious and moot. They say they discussed meeting with the defense to turn over the evidence earlier this month and actually provided some of it last week. The judge has scheduled a trial date for George Wagner for April 4th of next year. Now, George Wagner's attorneys have also requested through a subpoena the medical records and mental health records of Jake Wagner, and they've kind of implied that he may be a liar since he's changed his story from pre-arrest to now following the indictment. Uh, George or Jake Wagner's attorneys rather have asked the court to quash that subpoena, basically making saying make it go away. Brian. Interesting developments, Anjanette, thank you. Let's bring back civil rights attorney Jeff Storms and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, Jake Wagner admitted that the motive was about getting custody over his daughter, and that's why so many were killed. Does that seem a little over the top? You know what, Brian, that is a huge understatement. Yes, it is over the top. Listen, having custody of a child, there is no excuse for killing anyone, but for killing an entire family, I think it was delusional to 
believe that if you kill an entire family, you will get custody of the child. Obviously, it is a crime of passion. Obviously, if there are so many people killed in so many different places, it is a family who's involved or multiple people. And so I think, obviously, tying it back to the parent is going to not give that person custody. So I, I think it was delusional. I would agree. I think that's the right word to, to describe that. Jeff, with Jake Wagner pleading guilty to all 22 counts, does this open the floodgates for the family to turn on him and blame Jake for the murders? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly think it does present the opportunity for the, the floodgates to open at that point, and uh, it might be the path of least resistance for the uh, family. Now, Anjanette, you've covered this case for years. What do you see as George Wagner's options here? Well, you know, the death penalty was taken off the table. Jake agreed to testify, and as part of that agreement, uh, the death penalty was taken off the table for all family members. So George Wagner either rolls the dice and goes to the trial and gets life in prison, or he pleads guilty and he gets life in prison. I don't see that he really has any leverage at this point uh, against anyone. So I don't think he has many great options. I guess he could roll the dice and hope to maybe hang a jury or even get acquitted. Yeah, and as we see, we have George Wagner coming up first. Obviously, other defendants possibly coming up. So I don't know. It's like you said, roll the dice, see how this plays out, because his options are pretty limited here. Thank you, everyone. When we come back, why the trial of Robert Durst wasn't in session on Tuesday and why his close friend recanted about his whereabouts the night that Susan Berman was murdered. Welcome back. The trial of Robert Durst was on pause Tuesday. The real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend has a doctor's appointment for a cardio test. This break comes in the middle of testimony from a close friend of Robert Durst. Emily Altman is the wife of a former attorney of Robert Durst and is considered a close friend. In her pre-recorded testimony from 2017, Altman said that Robert Durst was in Los Angeles at the time of Susan Berman's death. That shocking admission was two years before Durst would admit to being the author of the now infamous cadaver note. She later recanted that statement after having a discussion with her husband, who told her he remembered things differently. At the time, he made this statement to you that he was in Los Angeles in December of 2000. Were you talking about Susan Murphy's murder? He said he was in Los Angeles at that time. What did you and your husband discuss with respect to your testimony on Thursday morning? I told him what I had said, and he said that he remembered it differently. And so are you saying that it wasn't you that remembered that all of a sudden what happened? It was that your husband told you you were wrong. Once cross-examination began, Altman spoke out about how Lewin was pressuring her on the stand, which ultimately led her to give false information about Durst's whereabouts. Looking directly at me, making eye contact, if she's speaking to me directly. Okay, so, Mr. Lewin, you know. Judge Susan Chris presided over the Texas trial for the death of Morris Black, in which Robert Durst was acquitted. She spoke with Law and Crime as to why Robert Durst's friends seemed so willing to help him. Number one, you've got these close friends of his that covered for him in spite of overwhelming evidence that he had to be implicated in not one but three different murders, okay? And they justify it. Do they justify it because they love him? Do they justify it because he's so rich? But they go through this mental gymnastics to try to justify everything he says and does and to help him perpetuate um, his innocence to get away with it. Jeff, from the looks of it and, and what the judge is saying, it looks like these witnesses are almost so enamored by Durst that they're willing to hide the body for him. Could that be a successful strategy for Prosecutor John Lewin in this case? 
Well, certainly. I mean, it, it raises doubt uh, for the uh, the credibility of any testimony that you might hear, right, that's being offered in order to uh, defend Durs. Uh, you know, it's surprising to hear that in some ways because uh, it would seem like these folks should have seen enough evidence by now to know his friends probably don't get treated very well. But it certainly uh, would seem like the strategy is successful so far. Yeah, and I would, I would love to see Lewin turn it around and say they've got to make these lies because look at the last friend who was about to tell on him, Susan Berman. I think it might be a good argument come summation. We'll see how that plays out, though. Terry Altman gives the prosecution that Durst was in California at the time Berman disappeared. Did he score any additional big points with this testimony? I mean, overall, Brian, he scored points because he did show, like Jeff said, that Altman was extremely close to Durst. She stuck by his side even through all these disappearances and murders. But I think also we got a couple of other points for the prosecution. One was that when Altman asked Bob to do her a favor, to get her son a job, he declined, and she was not happy about that. So it showed that Durst was only looking out for himself. And I think the other point that Lewin made here was Durst was unfaithful, and Altman testified that. She confirmed that he was unfaithful. So I think there was another small point there. So overall, I think Altman was a good witness for the prosecution, and clearly they would do anything for him, but he didn't do that in return for them. Yeah, we'll see how this plays out for Robert Durst. Of course, on Tuesday, as we said, he was out for a cardio test. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.